Okay. Uh, well, thank you for the uh, the introduction, Pat, and, and Shana for that introduction to the Lake Tahoe West effort. I'm going to be presenting the results of long-term uh, landscape modeling that we've done for uh, to evaluate socio-ecological resilience in this landscape. Um, the overall science team worked on uh, different scales. Other parts of our work were focused on more short-term effects analysis. And so if folks are interested in, in any of those, we have a number of publications out. And um, Sebastian will be talking about the hydrologic effects, uh, but we've also got some uh, work on fire behavior in aspen stands, uh, water quality effects of disturbances uh, in roads. Um, and so uh, what I'm going to be focusing on is uh, the right side of this graphic here, which is the long-term regime modeling, where um, we looked at uh, outcomes uh, over a long period um, for a number of different resource areas that tie to the uh, topics of interest that Shana was discussing. Um, and so we recognize that managers were primarily concerned with planning projects in a strategy that would be implemented over the next decade or two. Uh, our modeling simulated different directions that managers could go, like using a compass, and then we report on the expected outcomes from following that path. But obviously managers will have the ability to uh, meander uh, their path um, to actually even promote more uh, desirable objectives uh, or results um, based on conditions as they actually unfurl. Um, but this approach to what we've done, it helps to evaluate resilience a little bit more directly by seeing how the system is likely to respond to disturbances rather than just assuming that a, a particular condition will be um, uh, unresilient or not. And so the long-term perspective is important because we're concerned about trade-offs between short-term costs in particular and long-term gains. Um, and because the system has its own inertia as the forests are continuing to grow and because it's influenced by management and natural disturbances, which are linked to climate, which is changing. A long-term perspective helps to about consider rare but impactful events and feedbacks um, to enable a probabilistic evaluation of disturbances under different management scenarios. Um, so this approach is different from considering simply a, a what-if scenario of an extreme wildfire. This graphic shows the larger integrated modeling framework. Landis 2 is a process-based disturbance model, and that's kind of the, the central engine in a lot of the work that we're doing. Uh, it incorporates fire and bark beetles as well as climate projections. Um, and then we built linkages out to other models to look at uh, other resources um, that I'll be talking about here. So uh, in terms of water quality, smoke emissions, economics, and wildlife habitat, which uh, Angela will be talking about next. And then finally, we brought things together with uh, an ecosystem management decision support tool to help assimilate all the different indicators that we were evaluating and provide kind of an overall uh, summary uh, picture across the, the different indicators. Uh, looking at Lake Tahoe West, there's four management zones that have been delineated uh, for the entire basin. Um, and then within Lake Tahoe West, these four zones are roughly evenly distributed, so about a quarter in each one. Uh, a wooey defense area around homes, wooey threat, uh, which is kind of a buffer outside of the weed defense, the general forest and wilderness, which is primarily the desolation wilderness within Lake Tahoe West. Um, and you likely won't see many landscapes like this where there's uh, such a large amount of wilderness very close to a wooey. It's pretty distinctive and it, it um, kind of makes some of the results a little bit uh, uh, distinctive from other parts of the Sierra Nevada. This graphic represents the basic management scenarios that we modeled, which were intended to approximate different approaches that managers could choose from. None of them uh, precisely represents the restoration strategy that was ultimately uh, compiled. Um, that tends to fall kind of in the middle between uh, scenarios two, three, four, and five. But uh, the first one was a suppression only uh, strategy. The second one was uh, focused on thinning in the WUI, which was most like uh, business as usual or continuation of recent treatments. Um, so third scenario was focused on expanded thinning and more intensive thinning um, in, in all zones. 
Scenarios four and five were fire focused, uh, and they are just distinguished by different levels of prescribed burning. Um, they also included um, modest amounts of forest thinning in the WUI. And when we set up the models to represent these things, this is the amount of, of uh, area that's being treated as a percent of the landscape. So you can kind of contrast the differences between um, the four strategies and um, as I said, the, the actual landscape restoration strategy ends up kind of being between scenarios two, three, four, and five, at least as what the, the current projections are um, in terms of a, a balance of thinning and then gradually ramping up the amount of prescribed fire. And we did distinguish between mechanical thinning and hand thinning. Uh, in particular, hand thinning uh, re re removing smaller sized trees and relies on pile burning the material where we assumed that mechanical thinning could take larger material that could be then um, processed into wood products and biomass. This graphic represents um, the uh, indicators that we evaluated in the analysis. Um, and they're sorted into three categories on the left of community values, environmental quality, and operational feasibility. Um, so this is comparable to a triple bottom line framework or a coupled social ecological systems framework. In the interest of time, I'm only going to talk about um, a few of these indicators in, in detail, um, but uh, listeners are welcome to ask about any of the indicators that we considered or topics for which we didn't find a good indicator. One of the most uh, prominent indicators we looked at was area burned at high severity. And this chart uh, shows averages across four climate projections for futures with either very high or moderate increases in greenhouse gases. Um, there wasn't actually a, a tremendous amount of difference across those uh, different emission scenarios, but there was quite a bit of difference for this indicator in terms of the management scenarios. Um, and we also noticed that the uh, we expect a lot more fire in this landscape over time, and trajectories actually really start to accelerate um, in the mid-century. So around 2050 or 2060 period, uh, we see a lot more um, fire activity, although um, even under scenario one, we see a, a pretty sh a steep rise starting early on where <clears throat> there's only a, a fire suppression strategy. Um, the business as usual strategy uh, would bring that amount of high severity fire down over time. The moderate amount of prescribed burning scenario would bring that um, down further. And the two scenarios, three and five, that involve extensive thinning or uh, extensive prescribed burning um, ended up reducing the amount burned at high severity uh, by more than half. Another indicator that was of strong interest to managers and talked about in the assessment and the strategy was area burned in large patches. And they used a threshold of 40 acres for describing the patches that were considered large. This general pattern relates very closely to the previous slide about total area burned at high severity because you tend to get a lot of that area burned in relatively large patches. Um, this is, as opposed to the cumulative view that we had in the previous slide, this one shows it each decade, um, but it's showing a similar story in that scenarios three and five uh, really cut down on the amount of um, large high severity patches compared to scenario one with two and four being more intermediate. Um, and for reference, uh, I put a yellow line that uh, approximates the uh, amount that had been observed in the Illouette Basin, uh, which is a system that's been turned over largely to, to manage fires and prescribed fires but, uh, and fire manage natural ignitions um, over a decade. So um, this landscape is, is not necessarily, uh, we wouldn't expect it to burn uh, anything like a, a, a system that's returned to natural fire because um, there's so much wooey that uh, people are, are not going to want to see that much fire. Um, and then there's also a lot of high elevation wilderness that uh, actually doesn't burn as frequently. Um, so we didn't get uh, huge amounts of um, high severity fire compared to some other parts of the Sierra Nevada where we're actually seeing these uh, really large um, high severity events happening. <clears throat> 
Um, fire return interval is a metric that um, was discussed in the assessment and the strategy. It wasn't quantified in terms of an objective of actually reducing uh, or returning uh, fire intervals to a reference regime, but this just illustrates the uh, effects of the fire focus strategies on the right sides. Uh, scenario four brings down the average return interval to about 50 to 60 years in most of the forest. Um, and then the scenario five brings that down to about 20 to 30 years, which is probably within your uh, close to your, your natural range of variability, um, except in the wilderness areas where the, the fire return interval is, is less frequent because of the high elevation vegetation types that are there. And so to accomplish a lot of that fire under the fire focus scenarios, we were uh, using uh, prescribed fire and we assumed the prescribed fires would be done at low intensities and low severities um, based on conversations with fire managers about um, how they're likely to use fire. There's obviously a lot of uh, discussion about whether um, people might allow for more moderate severity uh, fire and that's actually discussed in the strategy is is allowing for more of that although um, certainly the recent history in the basin has been to have very uh, low severity fire um, in a lot of situations especially with uh, using creep around burn piles and things like that um, but the modeling suggested that uh, scenario four might undershoot kind of a reference range for area burned at low severity uh, while scenario five was actually producing a lot of, of high severity fire and might even be over estimating that. So to, if you really were trying to approximate a more natural fire regime, you might want to um, allow for more moderate severity fire, especially um, early as part of a more restoration approach in areas where it could be used safely. We can go from uh, talking about fire to talking about emissions from fires and uh, impacts to air quality. In terms of total emissions of fine particulates, the two thinning scenarios, two and three, were the lowest for those emissions. And the two scenarios that in, entailed uh, more use of fire would increase those emissions over time. This chart here doesn't include emissions from pile burning. And scenario four, which was a modest amount of of uh, prescribed burning, whoops, um, was actually very close to the suppression only scenario. But when you factored in the prescribed burning scenario, it moved up all the uh, scenarios that um, had some thinning treatments and uh, pile burning up a little bit higher. So the, the two fire focus would, would produce more um, cumulative emissions. But from a public health perspective, we're probably a lot less concerned about cumulative emissions as the daily emissions because um, the daily amounts uh, represent the um, levels that may be affecting local communities. Um, and so we sorted those emissions into bins ranging from moderate, um, which is in the green here, up to the purple of extreme, which is uh, pretty uncommon except under the scenario one. Um, and this just shows the contrast between the different scenarios where scenario three really reduces the daily emissions quite a bit compared to the other scenarios. The fire focused scenarios uh, allow a lot more moderate levels of emissions, um, but really reduce the amounts at very high or extreme. So we think there, there could be some significant gains for, from a public health and economics perspective from um, using more fire and certainly by doing more thinning as under scenario three. Turning to vegetation, I'll just show a couple slides for indicators that we're looking at there. This first one shows uh, the proportions of conifer dominated, hardwood dominated and shrub dominated systems in a stacked graph. Um, the basic storyline here was that the first four scenarios were pretty similar in trajectories, whereas scenario five kind of stood out in curbing increases in conifer forest and encouraging um, uh, maintenance of more shrub and promoting aspen habitat. Um, and so from a resilience perspective, if you're kind of assuming that current conditions are, are kind of within reference, um, then uh, uh, either a, a, a mix between scenarios uh, three, four, and five might um, get close to that optimum. But it's important to note that what we weren't seeing was a big shift towards shrub-dominated or oak-dominated 
kind of systems, which is a concern in um, other parts of Sierra Nevada at lower elevations. And that's reflecting that Lake Tahoe West is, is pretty wet and pretty high elevation compared to much of the Sierra. This indicator is looking at uh, area of um, tree with trees greater than 150 years old. Um, and that was kind of our attempt to look at old forest associated species. Um, not a huge difference across scenarios here, although it's noteworthy that scenario three actually tended to maximize this indicator. Um, and I think it's pretty conservative of maintaining uh, forests by reducing the amounts of, of fire, um, uh, especially high severity fire across the landscape. Looking at water quality, um, we did some integration of WEP results with the Landis results on disturbance uh, to project uh, changes in fine sediment loads and phosphorus loads. This is the result on the right here as a table looking at the first 50 years relative to a baseline of average fine sediment loads. And you see that the, the values there in, in percent are, are pretty similar across scenarios. Um, we did see increases over time with more wildfires. Uh, loads due to treatments are largely offset by reduced loads from wildfires, although the two fire focus scenarios entailed slightly higher loads, and I believe that's because um, the prescribed fire was assumed to reduce ground cover a bit more than thinning, and also prescribed burning is happening in areas that have shrubs, whereas thinning is only happening in forested area and the shrub areas um, often are more prone to erosion. Um, but overall, these projected differences are likely too small to detect with landscape scale monitoring. Another indicator that we looked at, and Sebastian will be talking about hydrology uh, shortly, but um, their work of the hydrology team found that leaf area index was a uh, useful predictor of potential uh, water availability or water yield. And Landis provided uh, measures of leaf area index. And so these are the results for that indicator. Uh, it's important to recognize the leaf in area index is basically tracking with increases in forest biomass and increases in forest carbon. And so this suggests that there's kind of a fundamental trade off between storing carbon and providing, uh, uh, making more water available and promoting resilience to drought. And so this is kind of an important takeaway for managers to be thinking about the relative importance of, of competing values um, across the landscape. Um, and, and the basic uh, pattern here is that all the scenarios leaf area index uh, was tending to increase, which would suggest less water availability, except under scenario five, which really reduced um, that uh, leaf area index and would potentially provide more water uh, either for streams or the lake or uh, soils and, and groundwater. Um, I'm giving a real brief summary of some of the economics results uh, where they looked at uh, a number of different parameters including the cost of implementation, cost of fire suppression, um, and the key findings there were that scenario three had the highest cost of implementation, even though it was obtaining some returns from thinning byproducts, both uh, uh, lumber material and um, bi biomass for energy, but the, the returns were, were not enough to offset the cost of thinning. Um, and um, the high prescribed fire scenario, or the two prescribed fire scenarios, um, um, had generally lower cost of limitation, and that reflects the lower unit area cost of prescribed burning. When we did the ENDS analysis, I'm just going to show one uh, kind of a summary slide from that, which suggested that scenario five uh, performed best overall. Um, and hopefully some of the previous slides will kind of explain what's driving that. It basically achieved a lot of uh, favorable outcomes, uh, including in terms of vegetation and, and fire regime. Um, and I think some of the, the potential downsides of using more fire were weighted uh, relatively low, um, but there were certainly um, some areas that uh, might be flags for managers to consider in terms of the number of days that would actually need to be have some kind of um, burning um, that, that got pretty high and that might start to uh, face some real social constraints. 
So some summary of key findings, uh, there's a lot of momentum in this system. Um, so in general, we would see more carbon stored, areas of old and large trees and late cereal vegetation will increase uh, and more water will be used or, or lost uh, due to that increases in vegetation. We would expect a lot more wildfires, but these fires will be less severe with treatment. Uh, the suppression only scenario did not promote resilience effectively. It had the lowest cost to implement, but high social cost. Um, even though it stored more carbon, the value of that stored carbon is pretty small compared to some of the, the risk to property um, and public health from um, high emissions and the risk of large stain or placing patches is also greater under that scenario. The increased thinning scenario reduced risk of, risk of wildfire in wooey areas and associated risk of property loss. It reduced high severity and extreme wildfire events, including high emission days. It increased water availability, which uh, should indicate increased resilience to drought. Um, it moderated the days of intentional burning because uh, it was only relying on some days of pile burning, primarily in the fall. It provided some forest byproducts and stored more carbon than the high prescribed burning scenario, um, but it did not restore fire regimes and non-forest, um, non-conifer forest vegetation as well as the fire focus scenarios, and it had the highest cost of implementation. The increased prescribed fire scenarios promoted many of the same outcomes as increased thinning, but implementation costs relative to area treated were generally lower. It favored the more shade intolerant and fire intolerant um, vegetation, aspen, yellow pines, and shrubs. It slightly increased uh, impacts to water quality, as I mentioned, due to reduced ground cover and disturbance in the shrub areas. Um, and it increased the days of intentional burning and total fine particulate emissions. So those are some of the areas that we flag for managers that may need um, more attention as they try to ramp up the level of burning. But overall, the Lake Tahoe West restoration strategy uh, seems to reflect a kind of a, a combination of the different scenarios that we modeled and a, and a favorable combination where increases in thinning and prescribed burning would uh, promote resilience uh, across the indicators that we looked at. Some of the next steps that we're looking at, in addition to continuing to try to support the uh, analysis of uh, impacts for Lake Tahoe West, um, is working on research and monitoring needs um, to evaluate key changes. So one of the observations from the model was that um, species like red fir are likely to decline um, with climate change. So that may be something that uh, people want to consider and, and whether more management in the upper uh, montane forest is needed. We're doing work on analyzing effects of treating steep slopes on water quality currently, and we're also um, launching a, a new effort to analyze opportunities to use fire across the landscape using the um, potential fire operational or, uh, delineations framework or pods framework. So that's a summary. This is a list of uh, science team members. I want to thank all of them and my colleagues on the uh, design team, um, including Shana and Sarah. So thank you very much.